Do you know where the guys are? I've got some work I got to get done. Yeah, they're out back. Hey, uh, were you uh, did you watch Andy Griffin last night? Yeah, that that was a great show. He and Opie then. Yeah. On B, remember on B? Probably the best I've ever seen there. I was uh, I was killing myself. I, t I fell down on the floor laughing, and the wife thought I was having a heart attack, you know, so... <laughs> Laugh my butt off, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's hilarious. Hey guys, we gotta go change some light bulbs outside. Come on, help me. Okay, we'll be right there, boss. Okay. What do you think, Alan? Perfect. Is that good enough? Yeah, I'll hold it. All right. Oh, this thing's gonna work here. Ah, we're gonna need a little more. Yeah, you're almost there. Yeah, we need yeah. uh... Hey, go get a couple of buckets. Yeah, good idea. Get a couple of buckets and I'll take care of it. Ready? Really? Yeah, put that down. In there. Oh, well, here. Oh, we, need to, oh, we need to make this a little higher. Oh, yeah. That's good enough. That'll be good enough. I don't even... I think, I think you are. You'll be fine, man. Oh, yeah. So what do you need to hold it? I, I can reach that now. You think oh, yeah. that? I think you could. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, that was good. What a good day you could Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. No problem. That's no problem. What you just witnessed happened all too often in the workplace before OSHA was established in 1970. The Occupational Safety and Health Act was signed by Richard Nixon on December 29, 1970. The act created the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, an agency of the Department of Labor. OSHA was given the authority both to set and enforce workplace health and safety standards. OSHA officially formed on April 28, 1971, the date that the OSHA Act became effective. OSHA's mission is to assure safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women by setting and enforcing standards and by providing training, outreach, education, and assistance. The agency is also charged with enforcing a variety of whistleblower statutes and regulations. Under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, United States states and territories are permitted to adopt federally approved occupational safety and health plans. These plans, which replace federal OSHA enforcement and receive partial funding from the federal government, are, requir are required to be at as least as effective in protecting wor workers as OSHA. They are also required to cover public sector employees. Federal OSHA does not cover such workers. 22 states administer occupational safety and health plans. The state of Arizona, under an agreement with OSHA, operates an occupational safety and health program in accordance with Section 18 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. Initial approval of the Arizona state plan was published on November 5, 1974, and final approval was published on June 20, 1985. The Arizona State Plan is administered by the Industrial Commission of Arizona, ICA, and within the ICA, the Arizona Division of Occupational Safety and Health, ADOSH, is responsible for enforcement and voluntary compliance. ADOSH is headquartered in Phoenix and has offices in Phoenix and Tucson. The Arizona State Plan applies to all public and private sector places of employment in the state, with the exception of federal employees, the United States Postal Service, private sector maritime, employment on Indian lands, areas of exclusive federal jurisdiction, copper smelters, and concrete and asphalt batch plants that are physically located within mine property, which are subject to federal jurisdiction. Efforts by the federal government to ensure workplace health and safety were minimal until the passage of OSHA. The American system of mass production encouraged the use of machinery, while the statutory regime did nothing to protect workplace safety. For most employers, it was cheaper to replace a dead or injured worker 
than it was to introduce safety measures. In the two years preceding passage of this act, 1968 and 69, there were over 14,000 workplace fatalities. In 2011, which was the last year statistics are currently available, there were 4,693 deaths. Transportation accidents were the number one cause of workplace fatalities, and the number two cause of workplace fatalities was uh, violence. I'll go over some t statistics right now. Transportation incidents accounted for more than two out of every five fatal work injuries in 2011. Of the 1,898 transportation-related incidents, about 1,075 were roadway incidents involving motor, motorized land vehicles that be car accidents. Non-roadway incidents, such as a tractor overturning in a farm field, accounted for another 11% of the traffic-related injuries. About 16% of fatal transportation incidents involved pedestrians who were struck by vehicles. Of the 312 fatal work injuries involving pedestrians struck by vehicles, 61 occurred in work zones. Workers who were fatally injured in aircraft incidents in 2011 accounted for 146 fatalities. Overall, 780 workers were killed as a result of violence and other injuries by persons or animals, including 458 homicides and 242 suicides. Shootings were the most frequent manner of death in both homicides and suicides. Another 37 deaths were due to animal or insect-related incidents. Fatal falls, slips, or trips took the lives of 666 workers in 2011, or about 14% of all fatal work injuries. Falls to the lower level accounted for 541 of these fatalities. Of the, a total of 472 workers were fatally injured after being struck by objects or equipment, including 219 workers who were struck by falling objects or equipment, and 192 were struck by powered vehicles or mobile equipment not in normal operation. What I'd like to do now is show a movie about the events in American history leading up to the passage of OSHA. I think you'll find this very interesting and informative. Following the Civil War, the American economy was expanding rapidly. In the closing decades of the 19th century, production rates were climbing and millions more workers were needed. Between 1900 and 1910, nearly nine million people immigrated to this country looking for work and a better life. But many also found harsh conditions, long hours, low wages. The work was tough and dangerous. As the production rate went up, so did the pressure on workers and the casualties. Railway workers had one of the most dangerous jobs. Nearly 15,000 were killed between 1902 and 1908. Mining accidents were frequent. 4,700 died building the Panama Canal. In a single Pennsylvania county, 526 workers were killed in one year. There were few government rules covering safety and health, and workers had few rights. There was no legal protection for unions. When workers did organize against these harsh conditions, their strikes were usually broken by the company, sometimes with the aid of hired police or government troops. Outraged journalists and social reformers began to support workers' efforts to organize. Photographer Lewis Hine exposed the horrors of child labor. Novelist Upton Sinclair, in his classic work, The Jungle, described the brutal lives of Chicago stockyard workers. He said, I wish to frighten the country by a picture of what its industrial masters are doing to their victims. Exposés like these finally led the government to create the first agencies to protect workers. Woodrow Wilson won labor support by agreeing to improve safety in the workplace. In 1913, the Department of Labor was established. Pressure for change was often finally effective only after a major tragedy. 
After 361 men died in the Monanga Mine Disaster of 1907, the Bureau of Mines was set up to supervise mine safety. Gradually, industry began to regulate itself in what is known as the Voluntary Safety Movement. The National Safety Council, founded in 1913, set voluntary guidelines for safety engineering and better working practices. Companies put guards around dangerous machinery, set up first aid stations, and began safety classes. But safety education stressed that most accidents were the workers' own fault. This film, made by the National Association of Manufacturers in 1911, was one of many that singled out workers' carelessness as a cause of disaster. But many terrible tragedies were not caused by workers' carelessness. The same year that film was made, a fire burned the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York. Because many of the exits were locked, 146 people, mostly young immigrant women, died. Again, it was only after the tragedy that the first permanent commission to inspect factory safety was set up in New York. During the same time, Industry helped establish a system to compensate workers for accidents. While this workman's compensation system gave employees a measure of financial security for the first time, it took away their right to sue the company for damages. The amount of compensation was limited, and workers were not represented on the boards that decided claims. But this growing concern for workplace safety had some noticeable results, and accident and death rates fell. In fact, many industrialists thought the safety problem was solved. This safety film ended with an idealized picture of a steelworker's life. So what do you, what do you think of when you think of OSHA? Well, one thing about OSHA, one was the positive side was, I worked in a place where we had a chemical room and we had a lot of incidents of people falling in the chemical room. And OSHA came in and said we needed traction mats. They put them in place and that took care of the problem. Like workers today, workers in the past faced not only sudden death or injury from accidents, but slow death from fumes, dusts, and poisonous gases. Doctors were slow to investigate these industrial poisons and the diseases that could result from them. The first major American study was not until 1910, when a young doctor, Alice Hamilton, investigated the effects of lead poisoning. There were further government studies into health hazards, but few industries applied their findings, and workers' health was virtually ignored by industry until the 1960s. Here you go, Frank Spriggs. <laughs> In the 1930s, hundreds of men were hired to dig the Gawley Bridge Tunnel in West Virginia. They, too, were ignorant of the risks they ran. Desperate for jobs during the Depression, they worked with virtually no protection in a tunnel thick with silica dust. 476 men died here from silicosis. My name is Walter Kincaid. I worked in the tunnel four or five weeks. Every day I hear of someone dying with silicosis. I worked until I got sick, and the doctor told me that it was silicosis. And he also told me that anyone that worked as much as, as 24 hours would not be living 15 years. I think something should be done for our wives and family after we are gone. Once again, after the deaths, there was a public outcry. I personally believe that 2,000 men are doomed to die as a result of ruthless destruction of life by American industry. The next year, 1936, the Walsh-Healy Act was passed. Although it only applied to contractors doing business with federal agencies, it was the first time the government directly imposed health and safety standards. One of the areas the rules covered was the use of respirators. 
The respirator is one of the oldest protective devices in history. And for years, workers' health continued to depend on respirators alone to keep poisonous dusts and fumes out of their lungs. But respirators often don't fit properly. They leak or simply don't filter out enough of the poisons. Today, government strongly favors cleaning the air in factories through ventilation and other devices. But through the 1930s and 40s, industry continued to rely on ever more elaborate respirators. Today, thanks to the cooperation of safety men in many industries and government departments who supported and helped guide the development of respiratory protection, the menace in the air is removed for those who wear respirators. For where men once died, we who wear respirators can now live safely. And life for us, like the air we breathe, is good. So what would you, what, what do you think would happen if OSHA came in today? What would, what would happen here at this workplace? I think they'd, they'd be pretty impressed, the way we run the operation. As far as I understand, there's no safety violations here, so I think we would be in pretty good shape. All right. Well, thank you, Alan. The 1930s. The Depression. Years when you were lucky to have a job at all. But Franklin Delano Roosevelt began New Deal legislation to help people during the Depression. He introduced jobs for the unemployed, Social Security, a minimum wage, and the 40-hour work week. Although most of these laws did not directly affect safety and health, they permanently raised the level of government concern about working conditions. The National Labor Relations Act made it a legal right to unionize. And in the 1930s, industrial unions organized and sought the right to represent all workers in an industry. In the automobile industry, for example, the United Auto Workers struck at Flint, Toledo, and Detroit and won the right to collective bargaining. Labor was emerging as a powerful force that would be better prepared to deal with later health and safety issues. Then came the war. Health and safety on the job suddenly became an important issue, largely because preventing accidents meant saving work days for the war effort. Save a day to keep them rolling. Save a day to keep him flying. Save a day that Americans of tomorrow may live in a land of peace, in a land where freedom reigns. Safety supervision was stepped up in federal war plants, and the need to keep workers healthy led to some advances in industrial engineering and medicine. The Public Health Service laid down its first standards setting maximum levels for dangerous air pollutants at work. But these first standards were often far too lenient to clean the air effectively, and they could only be enforced in plants with federal contracts. For the rest of industry, they were only voluntary guidelines, so many workers' health still depended on the goodwill of the company. With the end of World War II, the workplace itself was changing as an explosion of technological inventions and chemical discoveries brought a new slew of dangerous dusts, fumes, and gases that threatened workers. Workers usually did not know what they were handling or whether these synthetics might cause cancer years later. But in the 1950s, research into the health effects of these chemicals was minimal. It was not until the 1960s that a new revolution in occupational safety and health began, supported by two parallel political movements. The environmental movement began to question the long-term effects of chemicals on our health, and the civil rights movement made people more aware of the rights of each individual. These movements created a climate of reform, which encouraged other groups, including workers, to demand more control over their lives, including their safety and health. We're going to help shape a better future for the working people of this country and for their families. We are pledged to bring safety to the workbench and to bring safety to the job site 
Labor leaders worked with the Johnson administration to propose a new government agency to enforce health and safety rules. This year, I asked the Congress for a workers' safety bill to protect you. But once again, the law was not passed until after a major disaster, when 78 miners were killed at Farmington, West Virginia in 1968. I think all of us have been at fault in not taking aggressive action to preserve 20th century safety and health standards for the workers. Now there's a revolt in the mines, and the workers are going to get the kind of conditions that they deserve and should have had. Within one year, the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act was passed. And in 1970, Congress passed the Occupational Safety and Health Act. This confirmed in law the right to a healthy and safe workplace and established the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. The act says that employers have the primary responsibility for providing a safe and healthy workplace. OSHA is responsible for making safety rules and enforcing them. Workers have a right to talk to their supervisors, their union, or OSHA, about safety and health problems. So when I say OSHA, what does that mean to you? Uh, workplace safety. And now it's become more improved workplace safety. And uh, safety is important. So I think they're doing a good job and they're not getting as bad rap as they used to. So I guess that's what I think of workplace safety. Thank you, Steve. We are beginning to change our attitudes, to protest about dangers that used to be accepted as part of the job. We are moving from haphazardly protecting workers or compensating them after the fact to trying to prevent hazards from happening at all. Workers themselves are making history by questioning their working conditions, finding out the risks they run, and claiming their legal right to safety and health. So when you think of OSHA, what do you think of? I think that it's pretty much a good thing. They, they have these government regulations that are in place to protect people. Uh -huh. And uh, for the most part, I think it's a pretty good thing. Okay, thank you. Okay. As you just witnessed, the increase in workplace safety did not come about strictly due to the passage of the OSHA legislation. The 60s were a time of great change, which was evident by the peace movement, the environmental movement, the civil rights movement, and other factors. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration has had a long and embattled existence. Even before OSHA's creation, the idea of stricter federal regulations over workplace safety sparked considerable opposition from businesses. In January 1968, President Lyndon Johnson called on contra Congress to enact a job safety and health program stating, it was unacceptable for a modern industrial nation like the United States not to have tougher, regulation, tougher regulations aimed at reducing the rate of workers injured or killed on the job. President Johnson was unable to garner sufficient votes to pass this plan, leaving the creation of a new government agency charged with developing occupational safety regulations in the hands of President Richard Nixon. In spite of his pro-business affiliation, Nixon agreed to sign the landmark Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, which led the Department of Labor to create OSHA in 1971. OSHA was criticized during its inaugural decade of the 70s, partly for inc inconsistent decision-making when enforcing health and safety regulations, and partly by unrelentless opposition from big business to OSHA's mandate. This opposition by big business led to resistance, which forced OSHA to be tough when enforcing legislation at the very, very beginning of the agency's existence. The following movie illustrates a general misconception of the way OSHA enforced its mandate.
show last night on Archie. Oh, and All in the Family. Oh, but that was on last night. It was. And it I was. missed it. Yes. I watch it every week. And I know you do. Night. And last night it was all about the union. Oh, no. Yeah. It that was. would have been a good one for me to see. It sure would have. And He sure has some good ideas. He does. So Charlie comes and tells him everything that's going on about the, you know, everything that's going on. So he feels really left out. And it, was, it was pretty bad. And it didn't matter what he thought about it. No, yes. it didn't. He just couldn't. And Edith, of course, you know what she did. She ran around the table three times just yelling, oh, Archie! 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 <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Oh, sir, hands in the air. Right. Silver House, you drop those arms, you're going to be spending times in Florence with Blondie over there. <laughs> Things are very different now. OSHA and employers work hand in hand for the same goal, workplace safety. Recreation Centers of Sun City has used OSHA as a resource for workplace safety. Recently, we used them in regard to weight limits for lifting used by our employees. Here are some of the ways RCSC is being proactive when it comes to workplace safety and compliance. The utility workers have a green book, Center to Utilities Cleaning Standards, which has a section titled Protective Equipment. The Facility Attendance Manual also has a section in it which pertains to safety. Safety meetings, like right now, are a requirement for lead people. A safety meeting report is required once a month. A supervisor is required to give a monthly safety pre presentation like the one I'm doing right now. There's also a bulletin board for labor laws and workmen's comp posters at every facility. So what are some of the reasons OSHA or ADOSH in Arizona would show up at our workplace? Not all 111 million workplaces covered by the act can be inspected immediately. The worst situations need attention first. OSHA has established a system of inspection priorities. First is imminent danger. Imminent danger situations receive top priority. An imminent danger is any condition where there is reasonable certainty that a danger exists that can be expected to cause death or serious physical harm immediately or before the danger can be eliminated through normal enforcement procedures. Catastrophes and fatal accidents. Second priority goes to the investigation of fatalities and accidents resulting in death or hospitalization of three or more employees. The employer must report such catastrophes to OSHA within eight hours. OSHA investigates to determine the cause of these accidents and whether existing OSHA standards were violated. The third priority goes to formal employee complaints of unsafe or unhelpful working conditions and to referrals from any source about a workplace hazard. The Act gives each employee the right to request an OSHA inspect inspection when the employee believes he or she is in imminent danger from a hazard or when he or she thinks there is a violation of an OSHA standard that threatens physical harm. OSHA will maintain, confidentially if, OSHA will maintain confidentiality if requested, inform the employee of any action it takes regarding complaints, and hold an informal review of any decision not to inspect. Now let's take a look at what you should do if you're at work and OSHA does show up. Basically, you do nothing when it comes to the inspection. Get a hold of Marion or whoever is acting on behalf if she is gone. So what does the inspection process involve? When an OSHA op compliance officer arrives at the establishment, he or she displays official credentials and asks to meet an appropriate employer representative. Employers should always ask to see the compliance officer's credentials. 
we next had an open, opening conference. In the opening conference, the compliance officer explains how the establishment was selected and what the likely scope of the inspection will be. The compliance officer also will ascertain whether an OSHA-funded consultation visit is in progress or whether the facility is pursuing or has received an, inspe an inspection exemption through the consulting program. The compliance officer explains the purpose of the visit, the scope of the inspection, and the standards that apply. The compliance officer gives the employer information on how to get a copy of applicable state and health standards, as well as a copy of any employee complaint that may be involved. The compliance officer asks the employer to, se to select an employer representative to accompany the compliance officer during the inspection. Next is the walkthrough. After the opening conference, the compliance officer and accompanying representative proceed through the establishment to inspect work areas for safety and health hazards. The compliance officer determines the route and duration of the inspection. While talking with employees, the compliance officer makes every effort to minimize any work interruptions. The compliance officer observes safety and health conditions and practices, consults with employees privately if necessary, takes photos, videotapes, and instrument readings, examines records, collects air samples, measures noise levels, surveys ex existing engineer controls, and monitors employee ex exposure to toxic fumes, gases, and dust. An inspection tour may cover part or all of an establishment, even if the inspection resulted from a specific complaint, fatality, or catastrophe. If the compliance of officer finds a violation in open view, he or she may ask permission to expand the investigation. The compliance officer keeps all trade secrets observed confidential. Finally, there's a closing conference. At the conclusion of the inspection, the compliance officer conducts a closing conference with the employer, employees, and or the employee's representative. The compliance officer gives the employer and all other parties involved a copy of employer rights and responsibilities following an OSHA inspection for their review and discussion. The compliance officer discusses whether the employer the compliance officer discusses with the employer all unsafe or unhealthful conditions observed during the inspection and indicates all apparent violations for which he or she may issue or recommend a citation and a proposed penalty. The compliance officer will not indicate any specific proposed penalties but will inform the employer of appeal rights. Our CSC and OSHA have the same goals, keeping everybody safe in the workplace. Hope you enjoyed this presentation and I'm going to finish off with another movie showing exactly what it's like at our workplace. Well, you think we can make it with this ladder? I think so. This is a stretch boot should be on. Give it a whirl. See what you think. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We better go get the right size ladder here. I think so. Could be a bit tricky. We'll get the right one. Okay. I think this will be a lot better. Don't you? I don't think so, yeah.
So my question, Steve, is when I say OSHA, what does that mean to you? What comes to mind? Can you just walk in? I just need to get a block this off or whatever they say. Yeah, I like this better. Okay, now you can go back in. And then, and so this is where you would probably say, hey, did you see blah, blah, blah. And then you come in the room, Marion, and you guys just start talking. And action. Hey, Marion. Yeah. Did you see that, that show on Archie Bunker last night? Oh, I missed it last night. I watch it every week. Let me I tell forgot you. he was on. Let me tell you. We'll just kind of walk in. and You ready? Are you ready? Yep. Okay, let's right. just go. You just kind of walk in. Have some mic works yep. up, you know what? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Lean back and just get the start of the movie going. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. That was good? Okay, let's do it one more time. All right. One more time. Whoop. 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 Okay, I'm not going to walk in first. Okay. So, yeah. let's go. Mm -hmm. I thought Archie might lose his job. Oh, it was horrible. And then Edith came in, and you know Edith. <laughs> Archie! Archie! She ran around the table. But... Hi, I'm here today to talk about the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, blah, 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 